my mom is, she's looking at retirement way sooner than I thought she was going to. And so she wants to retire when she's 62. I don't think she's personally ready to retire at that age because yeah, her, her just retirement is I've been able to look at her accounts and it's just like, I don't, I think she's just going to live on social security to be honest. Hello, and welcome to Financials Podcast Future Rich. I am your host, Barbara Ginty, and I am also a CFP, which is a certified financial planner. And I am here with my guest today, Megan. Hi, Megan. Hi, Barbara. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Well, you tell us a little bit about yourselves and a little bit about your submission, because you sent in a, a good submission to come on the show. Yeah, yeah. Um... So I live in Los Angeles and um, I live with my husband and uh, we went through kind of a rough patch a couple of years ago. I got sick in 2021 and um, it was really rapid and very confusing. So we had been on like adult income and then um, I got sick and we're trying to figure things out. And then I actually had to stop working completely. So that was really scary because um, I'm pretty, I feel like I'm, you know, I'm in my thirties, so I'm really young. And so I didn't anticipate, um, not working. So, um, I had to spend a lot of money on, uh, doctors, uh, specialists, and we were running through our savings. I felt like we had a really healthy savings and, um, yeah, just things really fell apart. And I, I still don't have official diagnosis, which is okay. something I'm also uh, dealing with, <laughs> like the aftermath of that, just like, I'm not sure exactly what happened to me. I had a lot of theories and ideas. So, and they don't know. That's yeah, scary. Um, yeah. I, there was um, a lot of ideas that maybe there was like high mold outside of my um, place I was living in. And I got, I got better after I moved out. So I had to move out. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, we had to move in my mother-in-law. So that was challenging of like completely uprooting my life. So I was going through my savings, going through not having a job, going through disability, and then having to move away was, was really tough on both me and my husband. And how old were you? How old are you now? And how old were you at the time? Yeah, I'm 37 now. And that was when I was, was three years ago. Um, so 34. Yeah, 34. And did you have disability? Yeah, I actually had to fill, fill it out. Um, so I actually okay. had to fill it out for my mom years ago because she fell ill. And so I kind of was familiar, but it was still kind of a confusing process. And um, but I, I ended and up. Did you do it. Social Security disability or did you do disability like as an employee benefit that you had? Um, it was kind of both. So at first three okay. months, it was an employee disability. Okay. So I tried to stay on with the company for three months mm -hmm. and they graciously paid for my health insurance. And then. Um, I started to, and then after that, they said, okay, well, three months is over. I can't return to work. So then I went on state disability. Okay. Yeah. For a year. Which is, that's a lot harder to get usually. Yeah. I was, um, sh I was actually shocked that I got it. <laughs> so, um, my doctor at the time, luckily was like, I'll sign whatever. Like, I know you're yep. really ill and we don't know what's going on and you clearly cannot work. So I felt lucky in that sense of he was on board, but, um, yep. Yeah, I was very happy that I got it and I got it for the full year. That's that's amazing. And what were yeah. you doing? What was your job before you got sick? What yeah, it was um, like a remote sales manager job. And it was yeah, full time remote. Um, some I was starting to go back into the office. Uh, but yeah, it was a sales job. Very nice. Okay, so and what were you making before you got sick? Yeah, I was making about 60k at that time. Okay. Yeah. And yeah, being used to two incomes, right? And then because what disability is usually only a fraction of what you're making. So what was your disability? It was about close to 1500 pay period. It was actually higher than I thought. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. So, so it was about 50%. Yeah. About 50%. Okay. Yeah. It was honestly higher because I'm used to, um, I've been on unemployment and that's not okay. a lot, but so it's more no. than unemployment, but yeah. Okay. So, so it was about 50% for the disability. Cause so that's a lot to go through. Yeah. It was pretty scary. And yeah, I took that whole year off to recover. So I was, but fell in, ill in 2021, stopped working at the end of, well, at the beginning of 2022, and then just took that whole year off, lived with my mother-in-law, with my husband, and tried to just slowly rebuild. Um, again, I had to pay for medical expenses, and mm -hmm. I actually paid for a really expensive functional doctor, like a 
a naturopathic doctor because yep, a naturopath, the yeah. Person, yeah, they could, they're the only ones that actually could help me. Um, they're, but they're, they're out of pocket. Like, yeah. Yes. Completely out of pocket. Nothing covered by insurance except for like blood right. tests. Right. Um, so that, you know, I, my husband and I talked about, well, this is my health. It's very important. So we'll try to absolutely pay whatever we can. I mean, we're saving money because we didn't have to pay rent. Um, we paid like some minimal expenses with my mother-in-law. Um, but luckily at the end of 2022, I started to feel better where I was like, oh, I can do part-time work. I feel like that is totally f- physically possible, mentally uh, awesome. possible at that time too. Okay. So now you're back. So this is back work. Are you back working full-time or back working part-time or? Yeah, it's kind of in the middle of part-time, full-time. I get okay. benefits now. So I'm at 32 okay. hours at 27 an hour. Um, okay. I started with working 24 hours initially. Um, and then see. just just a couple, like two months ago, I, I moved up and I requested if I could work more and I got 32 hours. Perfect. And okay, so now you get benefits. Yes, now I get benefits. And and what is your role now? Um, so I I'm so I used to work in uh, museums and then I did like a crazy windy career path and I was like a sales manager and I did other things and so now I'm back in the museum world and um, okay. I work as a public programs coordinator so I do public programming for all ages at where I work. Oh, cool! And I love it. Okay, <laughs> that's great. Um, and then what does your husband do? Yeah, so he's a director of uh, kind of a niche program at a museum too. So we, okay. we met at, at museum at a museum, <laughs> and so we're both like museum people. Cool. And he's and, a, a director of his program. Okay, great. And how much does he make? About? Uh, so he um, just also got a promotion. So we both got okay. like hours increase, and kind of he got a title promotion. So now he's at ninety five ninety five k a year. Perfect. That's great. So maybe I think what would be interesting, because it's a little unique, do you want to talk about where you were before you got sick and where you are now? And we can kind of figure out how to get you to back to where you want to go. Yeah. Like before I got sick, I was at 60K. And then um, I'm just remembering that my husband was all, was working part. This is so funny because he was working part time too. Like he, the job he has now, they only offered a part time position, like his department. Okay. So I'm, I'm realizing like our, <laughs> our roles are like, and positions are kind of similar to now, actually, because I okay. like, was working part time. But I'm actually having a hard time remembering what his income was at that time. So I want to say he was going to make like 35k. Um, that's okay. also not right to like because it was part time. Um, yeah. Hours. So it, so income wise, you're probably ahead of where you were when you were sick yeah, as a so household. We're, yes, we're we're ahead now. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. And then from the savings standpoint, you said you had to spend a lot of your savings when you were sick. Yeah. And so we, um, like earlier this year, we were like at 5k with our savings. Um, okay. and before I, when I got sick, I was at 20k. Like I had felt like it was a really, that was like the most money I've ever had in my savings yeah. before I got sick. But then another thing happened was my brother-in-law passed away in um, March. And so he left us money. <laughs> okay. So it was very generous. And so our, our finances are kind of complete or is changed again. So now our savings, uh, in our check or in our savings account is 85 K right now. Currently. That's fantastic. Yeah. So he left us a hundred K through his checking account. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we have, uh, we still have to figure out what to do with a hundred K in uh, a traditional IRA. So it's your husband. It was left directly to your husband, the, the IRA. So yes. it's an inherited IRA, which means yes. it needs to be depleted within 10 years, by the end of the 10th year. Yeah, that's my understanding. I just, yeah, I just don't know how, I, I would love to talk more about like how to withdraw that. Cause yeah, I'm just really confused on like how, how that works. So you got 85,000 just cash from your father-in-law and then a hundred thousand in an IRA. Sorry. He gave us a hundred, um, a hundred K just cash, but we use just cash. Yeah. We use that to pay off a lot of debt and okay. um, yeah, kind of reset and then put it into savings. So we're at 85 K now. Perfect. After you paid off your debt. So you have at this point, you have no debt. No, I still have debt. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we still have a, do you want me to go through the, yeah, let's stuff? go through yeah. it. Well, why don't we, we um, actually, let's take a step back. Let's talk about where your current expenses are and then we'll go through what you have for debt. Okay. And then we'll talk about, it sounds like we don't maybe need to rebuild as much from your illness, but we can talk about what to do with the inheritance and how that works. Sounds good. 
Okay. So let's start with the fun part, housing. Yeah. Um, we are very lucky. Uh, we pay 1200 in rent. Um, okay. It is a family owned property. So that's, okay. we don't expect it to go up anytime soon. Um, so yeah, 1200 a month. Perfect. And then what are some of your other expenses? What do you come to around monthly for expenses? Yeah, right now it's about um, 4700 a month. Okay. That's with, um, our, we just adopted a cat this year. We have cat expenses, subscriptions, utilities. Uh, we pay a lot for groceries because okay. um, I have a lot of food allergies. Well, there's allergies or sensitivities to food post illness. Mm -hmm. So we pay like 1200 for groceries a month because I think that, yeah, like I feel like food is medicine. So yeah. I don't, I don't really hold back on buying organic food or organic snacks. And I have to make a lot of my food now. That's, I mean, hardly eat out because I have to make so much of my own food um, after my illness. Okay. So 4,700 are your expenses. Yeah. And then do you know about what you bring in monthly net between you and your husband? Yeah, so net is so uh, my net pay is twenty two thousand eight hundred fifty six, and okay. then his is five thousand two hundred eighty one. So then combined your with your nets, so you bring in approximately eight. We'll just say eighty one hundred. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, and then your expenses are forty seven hundred. So you have about thirty four hundred left over monthly. Yeah, that sounds right. Mm -hmm. And then. With your work, so you just became eligible for benefits. So I'm assuming, are you on your husband's benefits at his That's job? Right. Yeah. So healthcare, you, okay. Mm -hmm. Healthcare. Everything. And then are you healthcare? And then is he in a? Is it a 403b? Yes, we're both on a 403b. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. And do you know what your contribute? What you're contributing? For uh, yes, I'm doing a four percent match currently, and okay. he's doing a five percent match um, right now. So you're each contributing, you're contributing four, he's contributing five. And then does your, do the employers give anything? Yeah, that's both our, the employer match too. That's what we, that's the combined. Okay, yeah, so 4%. So he's, a, mm -hmm. so he's doing like two and a half and they're doing two and a half or something. Uh, no, actually he's doing five and they're doing five. And then, oh, so you're, okay. Yeah. And then, and yours is four and four. Yeah. Four and four. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So that's good. So that, so the net is after you both contribute to retirement, you're getting good matches. Um, yeah, that they're do doing a dollar for dollar up to that mm -hmm. percentage. So you're at 8% total with using the match and then your husband's at 10% total. Okay. So let's talk about, let's go through the debt and then let's go through your savings. Okay. Yeah. So the debt, um, uh, we still have a car loan. Um, I, I have been debating if I should pay this off. We should just pay it off right now. It's at just about 9,000 and the interest is 2.95. It was a five year That's loan. That's a good rate. Yeah. <laughs> I, we have really good credit. And so we bought it in just before I got sick. So, um, okay. yeah, so it's, it, you know, we're just kind of just paying a regular monthly payment. Um, so yeah, I've just been debating if we should pay that off. And then okay. my other debt, the only other debt we have is my federal student loan and that's at okay. 30,000. Okay. Average interest is about 5.7, uh, for that. And I'm just kind of paying minimums on that, but I do okay. only have four years left of the student loan forgiveness. I was, I was going to say you're in the forgiveness program, right? Yeah. So I did okay. many years in museums. And so I have, yeah, they just said I have four years left. So this year I do want to start um, doing the payment so that I can get credit. Cause right now I'm just paying um, like very, very minimum, not getting credit currently. Yeah. It wasn't should... 30 hours yet. Yep. Okay. So yeah, I would definitely get the credit and then I would go continue through the program and get it forgiven. I think okay. that's your absolutely your best option. Okay. And that's the public service one, right? Yes. Yes. Public service. Yep. So there's no tax ramifications to the public service loan forgiveness, which is great. Oh, okay. Yep. Yeah. Right. So you just want to make sure you're logging it and making sure you're certifying with your employer. You have to certify every year, which okay. obviously you've been, you did previously when you were in museum um, world. Yes. So yeah, that's fantastic. And for the car loan, I don't know that I would pay it off for 2.95%. Okay. If you put the money, even if hopefully that 85,000 is in a high yield savings account, it making is. five. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're up 2% right there. Yeah. Okay. That validates me. Cause I was like, I could just pay it off, but yeah, the interest is 
is really, mm-hmm. really low. So, okay. If your interest was like 9%, I'd be like, let's get rid of it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but you, 2.95 doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, um, no. And you, it, should you need to, you can always pay it off. But right now I think your money's better off being liquid and available to you than than getting rid of a low interest rate loan, small okay. loan. Okay, so let's go over your savings. So we know the inheritance, the 85,000 we have in savings, 100,000 in the inherited IRA. And then uh, what else do we have? Yeah, so I have, sorry, retirement rollover from my museum time. And that's yep. currently at about 50K. Great. And that's a traditional IRA or a Roth IRA? That would be traditional. Yeah. Okay. And then currently at, with his 403B is about 30,000 since he's been okay. working there. Perfect. And then currently mine, cause I just started, um, contributing in April. So it's only at like 600 right now with my right, current. We just employer. started. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you have over, just over 80,000 in retirement. Yeah. Which is with our, um, yeah. From our work. Perfect. And any other accounts I should know about? Um, no, that's it. That's, that's okay. a really good picture. Perfect. Well, I think you're in a really good spot. I was nervous when you said <laughs> in your submission that, because getting sick can really derail plans, right? Because it's yeah. twofold. You're spending money and you're not making money. Mm-hmm. Even with disability, which disability is great and helpful, but it normally doesn't replace the full amount. So it's years of not contributing. But I don't, it seems like you're, you know, the inheritance help, nobody wants to lose yeah. a parent, but now you said your save, your savings was at 5,000 now. So, I mean, the difference really from your savings prior, if we don't even include the inheritance is just $15,000 different. And it seems like the income has kind of flipped itself, as you said. So your husband was part-time and now you're part-time and, and he's jumped up significantly. So it seems like it all worked itself out and you both have employee matches and now you have benefits as well. So I'm assuming that benefit is the, a- the access to the retirement plan and the, um, the match now that you're like full-time part-time, I guess is what Correct. you call it. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's like my main benefit there. Um, and now I get like sick and vacation or I get, I always had sick time, but vacation time I get that now. Mm-hmm. That's oh, benefit. that's fantastic. So you can get yeah. paid vacation. Yes. Um, You know, it sounds like you're in a good spot. And so the way, the way it'll work with the inheritance for your husband is with an inherited IRA, um, the way it works, if you're a non-spouse, so parent to child, any, any relative non-spouse, um, is you have to, if it falls under the most likely rules, there's like a flow chart, but if we just use the one that I'm most likely you're falling under, uh, or your husband's falling under, it would be having to be distributed over 10 years. And so the easiest way or usually the most tax efficient way is to take it out proportional over those 10 years. So mm-hmm. we'll just use quick math. So 10,000 a year over 10 years. Uh, you do not have to do that. You can choose how to take it. So you could take it over three years, over five years. You could take it in one year. Mm-hmm. Um, the thing that you want to be conscious of, and so if you have an accountant, you could ask, is the tax ramification. So a traditional IRA is 100% taxable at your ordinary income rate. So basically you would look at your tax brackets, right? And see where you fall for married filing joint. You will, I don't know state of California. I know New York state, we'd have, you'd have to look it up, but New yeah. York state, you get a $20,000 um, credit essentially for retirement distributions where you don't owe state tax. I don't know if California does that. So in this instance, if you were taking 10,000 a year, you'd owe no state tax if you were in New York, caveat. Mm-hmm. If, so you have to check for California if they give you any sort of benefit for retirement distributions. And then you would owe federal wherever you fall federally at your ordinary income rates. And so oftentimes, so confirm with your accountant, but oftentimes it makes sense to take it proportionally over that 10-year time frame to reduce the tax of tax ramifications. Okay. So- and with an IRA distribution, this is something that people don't often know. You can have the taxes and most likely you should have the taxes withheld when you take the money. So okay. for instance, let's just say you don't owe state tax. I don't know that, but you don't owe state tax. You're going to owe federal around 20%. So then you would withhold 20%. So the distribution would be 10,000 gross and you would net 8,000 on it. And you would do that until the 10th year, at which point 
it may or may not be depleted. So you could have more depending on the market performance, right? Because if it's invested, you could end up having to take a little bit more each year if there's good performance. And on the flip side of that, you could end up having to take less. So if there was a big market move and the account value goes down, you would take less in that year in theory. So, but the best thing to do is to check with your account. And oftentimes though, um, we see people take it proportional over the most amount of years possible to reduce taxes. Okay. Sounds good. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah. I think it's held at like my husband, my, so my father-in-law's, um, he had a small bank in North in where he lived. So, okay. um, they're kind of asking us like what we should do with, they're asking us like how we want to move forward with it. So can I, could I do a rollover to. So, okay. So it has, so it's still in your father-in-law's name. Yeah. I'm guessing that's the case. Cause they're like, okay. we, we need to figure out by the summer, like what you want to do with, with yep. this account. Yeah. So what happens is when it goes, so it's, it's called an inherited IRA. So it moves from your father-in-law. We'll just call it, call him Bob. So it okay. goes from, it's in Bob's name. So it just says Bob yeah. IRA. Right. right. Okay. And then your husband is the beneficiary, right? We'll just yes. use, make it easy. Say he's a hundred percent the beneficiary. There's nobody else. So okay. then it goes from Bob, we'll call your husband, Bob Jr. To Bob Jr. So then they open up a new account that says there's a traditional IRA for the benefit of Bob Jr. And then it has DECD deceased Bob Sr. Mm-hmm. So okay. both names stay on it. So it doesn't, it cannot be moved from Bob Sr. to Bob Jr.'s IRA. It has to be a separate account, which retains both names, and it's called an inherited IRA. And that's how they track where it came from and who it's going to. Mm. So he, he needs to open an inherited IRA. He doesn't have to. He could liquidate it all in one shot. But I, not an account and not tax advice, but probably not what I would personally do because of the okay. taxes. You live in a high tax state. Um yeah and you have good income. So I would consult an accountant, but most likely what you'll do is you'll move it from Bob Sr. into Bob Jr.'s name as an inherited IRA. So Bob Sr.'s name will stay on it. And then you'll take it proportional over the next 10 years while withholding for federal taxes. And you can ask your accountant what you should hold approximately so that when you go to file your taxes, you don't get any surprises or minimal surprises. Okay. But yeah, it has to move into what's called an inherited IRA. Okay. Got it. That makes yeah. complete sense. Now yeah. the inherited IRA, if you don't like the bank that currently has Bob Sr.'s IRA, it mm-hmm. doesn't have to stay there. The Any firm can open an inherited IRA. So if Bob Sr., who was older, had it in a bank in a money market or in cash, which you could do, maybe that doesn't make the most sense for your husband, Bob Jr. Maybe it makes more sense for Bob Jr. to invest it over the next 10 years, because maybe then at the end of 10 years, instead of it being 100, it was 120 he received. Also, on the flip side, if it's invested, it could be worth only 80 over 10 years if the market doesn't perform. But it doesn't have to stay at that company. So you can open an inherited IRA anywhere. Usually before you move it, though, from like a logistics standpoint, it needs to be in the right capacity, right? In the right format, which is an inherited IRA. And then once you have it structured that way, then you could always move it wherever you want it. Okay, great. Yeah, that's very helpful because that's been yeah. a little confusing. Yeah, It's super confusing because people assume it's just an IRA. It'll just become my IRA. And yeah, the, the deceased name stays on it and it's a tracking purpose of like, where did it come from? Who is it going to? And if there are like multiple Bob juniors, right? If there's four siblings, it would be split depending on how the percentages were specified. It would be split into four separate accounts. Every sibling has their own account, makes their own decision. Okay. Yeah. He just there, has one sister. So. Okay. It's, so it would go 50, 50. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 And it's, uh, it's up to how it would, the, you know, Bob senior decided. So if he said 70, 30, that's what it is. If he said 30, 70, you know, reverse, or if it's 50, 50, but every, each uh, beneficiary gets their own account. Okay. That makes sense. That makes their own decision because everyone has different. So his sister will have a different tax ramification than he will. Okay. Cause it's separate. Yeah. Got it. Yep. It's separate. Okay. But yeah, it's the 10 year rule. So you just want to make sure you have a plan for how you're going to distribute over that time frame. So, and it's worth asking an accountant, and also like taking a look at like where your own finances are. Like, do you think you'll be making 
more money in 10 years? Would you also potentially be making 95 if you move up to a director role? Then maybe you take a little bit more over the next five years versus over 10. Those are things to kind of talk about with the accountant. Okay. Yeah, I feel like this might be our, hopefully our lowest income because I'm not, I'm still at 32 and my goal is 40. And so, yeah, that's something to think about for sure. Yeah, that's definitely something to think about that if your income is going to increase, then maybe you take a little bit more in the front, you know, the first five and Mm -hmm. a little less in the last five, but it's not a perfect science because you don't know what the value will be if it's invested, but it's worth just chatting it out with the accountant. And what I always say is, you know, with the taxes, it's something that we have to pay. Right. And so at the end of the day, you're still getting something, even if you, you know, the, the tax ramifications probably won't be consistent over the 10 years and that's okay. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. And then the cash is really easy. You don't have to deal with any of this with cash. It's just yeah. yours. <laughs> yeah, I was surprised how easy it was. Um, uh-huh. you know, it just like, gets deposited and you're like, okay. Yep. That's you're like, thank you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the inher- inherited IRAs are complicated. I see them get messed up often, honestly, mm-hmm. like with being told what the distribution rules are because the distribution rules changed not that long ago. And so sometimes people are given wrong information. Mm-hmm. So, okay. and don't realize it's two separate accounts, don't know about you know, whether or not there's state ramifications or not. So just something to be weary of, but I would just figure out where you're going to fall tax wise and then make an educated decision. And you can only make an educated decision with today's information, right? Every year things change. So just make your best decision for today and you can just adjust yearly if need be. Okay. That sounds great. Overall, I think you're in a good spot, especially given you had, you know, a year, no one wants to get sick. It's the worst. Yeah. I just, yeah, I feel really lucky because You know, like before when I got sick, we actually, the 20K came from some family and we decided instead of a wedding just to put it in savings. So that kind of helped because we got married right before the pandemic in like December 2019. And so I'm so thankful we did not use that towards a big wedding. And then we had that money to carry us through. And then when I got sick, that was kind of a, a really great cushion um, and then again, like this inheritance came in, I felt like we were saved again. So I, I kind of feel like um, we have a lot in savings because of just kind of this big flux of change of the pandemic and yeah. then me getting sick. And so, yeah, currently in my head, the the savings is like 50000 is our one year emergency fund. Yep. And then I think we want to buy a new car um, probably in the next within the next two years. So kind of earmarking like 30,000 for that. Okay. Um, but I just, I don't know if that's like too high to have in cash or if I should just, if that's okay to just, that's what makes us feel comfortable. <laughs> yeah. So I'm never opposed to having money in cash. It yeah. prevents problems. And as you found out, no one plans for the problem to happen. You know, you don't want the problem to happen. You just plan in case it does, unfortunately. Yeah. And the hope is, you don't get sick or there isn't an emergency, but we can't avoid that often. Right. Yeah. And the worst, I think what it would, would have been a worst case scenario was you got sick and had no cash. That would have been unnecessarily stressful. And obviously when you're sick, they always, I think the first thing we always say is like, reduce stress, um, yeah. which is impossible, which is impossible to do if you're like, we can't pay our bills like that. Yeah. It's very stressful to have yeah. that, be under that financial pressure. I think the great thing about the environment we're in currently is you're actually making money on your cash. So as long as that's in a high yield savings, I have no issue with you having extra cash, especially because hopefully you don't get sick again, but God forbid you you do, you're prepared for it. So I think 50,000 in an emergency fund is a, is great. Um, I think it's smart to earmark the money if you need a new car. I, you live in one of those cities where you have to have a car. Like oh, there yeah. is no... Yes. <laughs> there is no other option in LA. Absolutely. Yeah. We have to have both cars. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. You both have to have cars. Yeah. I've had people on the show, if you've listened, where I'm like, you should get a bicycle. And they're like, what? And I'm like, you don't need the car. The car is an unnecessary luxury compared to like what you're trying to achieve, you know? But in LA, yeah, there is no walk. I walked one time. I couldn't, I was not a good driver living in the city for so long. I went to a meeting for LA and I like saw where I had to go. And I was like, I can't you could drive all the way down this highway to loop around. I was like, I'm just going to park the car and walk. And people were just staring at me. Like I was an alien as I was like walking down the side of the freeway. I was like, I can't be late for this meeting. And then I got there. My (laughs) boss was like, 
where did you park? And I was like, oh, down the road, like down the freeway at that parking garage. And he was like, how did you get here? And I was like, I walked. And he was like, you walked down the freeway. And I was like, mm-hmm. yeah, I didn't want to be late. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was like, you, yeah. I was like, can you drive me back? Because I was getting stared at. And he was yeah. like, yes, I'll drive you to your car. <laughs> yeah, you look like a weirdo. Yeah, we both like such a weirdo. Yeah. They're like, you're walking to LA. That is abnormal abnormally here it's unbelievable if anyone hasn't tried it if you walk in la you get st- even if there's a sidewalk no one else is on the sidewalk oh, yeah. yeah yeah people just drive walk- just to go down like the street yes. or yeah they're just it's all cars I was like cars here. there's a sidewalk and i need to go to that walgreens i'm just gonna walk there and you walk there and people are like what is she doing on the yeah. sidewalk why is she in her car <laughs> yeah where's her car <laughs> <laughs> Taking care of your health isn't always easy, but it should at least be simple. That's why for the last three years, I've been drinking AG1 every day with no exceptions. It's just one scoop mixed in water once a day, every day, and it makes me feel ready to take on my day. That's because each serving of AG1 delivers my daily dose of vitamins, minerals, pre and probiotics, and more. It's a powerful, healthy habit that's also powerfully simple. With AG1, I know I'm getting essential brain, gut, and immune health support with vitamins, probiotics, and nutrients from Whole Foods. I like to think of it as my nutritional insurance. I know I'm covering my nutritional bases from the very start of the day. If there's one product I had to recommend to elevate your health, it's AG1, and that's why I've partnered with them for so long. So if you want to take ownership of your health, start with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3 plus K2 and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase exclusively at drinkag1.com forward slash future rich. That's drinkag1.com forward slash future rich. Check it out. Yeah, because you definitely need a car. You're in a, mm-hmm. that type of city. Um, so I think it's good to be prepared for that. That's a big expense to be prepared for it. Um, so if that's 50, that's 30. You have a little extra. The one thing you can consider is you are under the, with Mary filing joint, you are eligible. You're both eligible to do Roth IRAs. Mm-hmm. If you wanted to each fund a Roth IRA, you could. Okay. That's it would just increase the retirement. The other thing you can do, the other way to do it, because for those who listen to the podcast, I all I care about is retirement. I don't care if it's traditional or Roth. And it really is up to where your tax bracket is. If it one makes sense over the other, there one is not better than the other. Yeah. Um, you could also increase your 403Bs if you want it to get more of a tax break with that okay. um, and just take the difference from savings. Just do that for a little bit to bump up the retirement. Okay. But I think keeping 80 keeping the 80 and then you have 5,000 like left over. So one person can do a Roth or you could increase the 403B slightly. Okay. Or you can yeah. just leave it. Yeah. One, two things kind of that, that I'm thinking about in the future is you definitely want to do a trip to Europe. Ideally 2028 because the Olympics will be here and I don't want to be here when the Olympics happen <laughs> because cars will be everywhere and they'll be wild. And so um, I just don't want to be here when everyone's here <laughs> in 2028. Um, okay. Yeah. So you so, could save the 5,000 for that. Okay. Instead yeah. of increasing retirement, just keep retirement where it is. Okay. What I will say is though, when you continue to get these raises, start increasing your retirement, keep yeah. increasing it. So when you get a raise, like your husband just got a raise. So the percentage effectively helps, but you could always start bumping it up like 1% a year. Mm -hmm. So from five to six, six to seven, it's nominal. You won't really feel that much in your pay. Um, And then what are you doing with your leftover? So we we talked about that you have approximately 3,400 leftover monthly. Yeah. So that's kind of, um, it's been, since everything's been kind of newer this year, I have been, we've been paying um, like for furniture that we've been wanting in like Uh, Just like fun stuff that we don't necessarily need, but we want, but we're coming to the point where like, we don't want to spend extra, we don't have anything else to spend on, which is so fortunate. So, um, that is kind of what I'm thinking about because it does feel like money is just kind of pouring in, which is nice. I never had this much income before. Um, so yeah, I just, I, I'm thinking of bumping up, like you said, the retirement percentage. I would bump up the retirement. Um, Yep. Or, or putting it into the Roth is kind yeah. of what I was thinking. Yeah, or you could do a Roth. So you could leave the 85000 is in the savings. It's the car emergency fund and a future vacation. Okay. And then with the extra monthly, 
the, you know, for each of you, you could each do 7,000 in a Roth, which is like base, even if you did 6,000 each in a Roth, that's four months worth of extra money. Mm, okay. Right. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And then if you do that each year, you'll, you'll help, you know, kind of bump up your retirement. Okay. That sounds good. Yeah. Um, I think get comfortable. You went through a lot. So I think once you're comfortable, everything feels safe and secure and you have the extra, I would take the extra, even if you set it up automatically where like 1500 just goes into another savings account. And then once you accrue mm -hmm. some, you could say, okay, we didn't need it this year. We're going to put, we're each going to put, you know, 5,000, 6,000 in a Roth because we yeah. have it. Yeah. Well, that's kind of, I was thinking of like, I'll just accrue it. And then what is my deadline Decide. for a Roth for for the year. Yep. That's a great question. So your deadline for 2024 is actually April 15th or whatever day tech tax filing is next year. Okay. So you have till 2025, oh, the beginning okay. of 25 to file. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I can yeah. just keep it. And then... you can just save it. And I think the idea of automating it is nice because it just will happen automatically. And then if you do 1500 a month, you should still have about, you know, 1900 left over for a cushion. Yeah. And then you should see how much you have at the end of the year. And then that way you have extra buffer in case something happens, mm -hmm. but then you probably won't need it given that you have a really good emergency fund. And so then you could just decide, okay, we're each going to do a Roth this year. Okay. Yeah. That sounds yeah. great. Yeah. I think I've been hesitant. Well, you know, it's all coming in pretty, yeah, pretty recently. So I think it's been kind of like just mentally catching up to where I'm at and just seeing like, this is the most amount of money we've ever had. And then just the money keeps coming in. So yeah, just, just it great. feels like a mental shift uh, for sure. Yes. Yeah. It's definitely a mental change. And so I think that's why for you, I would err on the side of just like storing it up in a high yield savings account and then saying, mm -hmm. okay, we're at the end of the year. We've saved another 10, 12,000 with the excess monthly that we don't need. And our emergency fund is growing because we're getting 5% on it. Right. You know, we have the money for the car that we have money for vacation. So yeah, we'll just do, we'll each do 5,000 in a Roth. You could do okay. that. And, okay. or the flip side is you increase and there's no right or wrong here. The flip side is you increase the 403Bs and you take home less monthly. So right. instead of having 3,400 left over monthly, maybe you have 2,000 left over monthly. Okay. That's Either cool. is fine. Right. Yeah. You can just choose what feels more comfortable. And I always say this, if you do this one year, it doesn't mean you have to do it next year. You could say on January 1st, like we're actually just going to increase the 403Bs. I don't want to worry about managing it. I just want to live on what comes in and I don't want to deal with anything else. You could do that too. So you're not beholden to the same decision next year. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. You can always switch. But then I think you'll be in a good, you have a very, as you said, you have a very, I think very reasonable cost of, um, you know, expenses and housing costs, which for LA 1200 is unheard of, <laughs> yeah. unheard of. Yeah. So it gives you the opportunity to save more. Mm -hmm. And so I think now that you're kind of back on good footing with income and debt reduction, you'll be in a good spot. Great. Without this inheritance, I was like thinking we would be in the spot like five, five years from now. So it's, yeah, again, just the mental shift of like, <laughs> don't have to say, but well, we do have to say, but it's just not as the, the idea was like way different than I thought it was going to be. So yeah, just that shift. And you just never yeah, know what's going to happen. No, you never yeah. know what's going to happen. Yeah. With your husband. So he's going to have, let's just say 8,000 net of taxes coming in. So he could always put that in the Roth and then you could do the Roth. You could still probably both increase your 403Bs. This first year, get your footing mm -hmm. um, and see exactly what you're going to net and what the CPA says about the inherited IRA. But for 2024, the limit for a Roth and you're underneath the income threshold is 7,000 okay. per person. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But no, I think you're in a good spot because between the savings and the inherited IRA and then your own retirement accounts at... 80,000, 160, you're at like over 260,000 yeah. net worth. Yeah, yeah. Which is great. Yeah. And I really like the idea that, so this is a family owned property. Yes. Yeah. It's through our, uh, my brother-in-law. Yeah. Okay. So you'll be able to stay there and then have reasonable rent. 
Yeah, we we're, they ideally would like us to stay here forever. I don't know. Oh, that's amazing. To, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Unless something happens, you know, I don't know. I, again, I'm just like traumatized. So I'm like not sure what's going to happen in the future. But it is a very secure housing. Um, it's kind of a beneficial arrangement because we get to maintain the property and they need okay. renters anyways. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. But I don't know if we want to stay here um, for a long time. So, yeah, it just we're kind of just staying here stable. It's all about stability right now. It gives you a really big opportunity to save. Yes. Yes. That's what our brother-in-law told us. He said, yes, we'll have rent and save. Yeah. Yeah. Because you're, I mean, what would that apartment market price go for in LA? Oh, I I mean, yeah, it's like a two, three bedroom, two bath. So I don't, I don't know, maybe 3,000. I'm, yeah, I don't know. (laughs) It's definitely not what I'm paying now. So yeah, I would use that to, to save. So I think your opportunities are for saving is make sure that the inheritance is in the cash inheritance is high yield savings account. I would look, and you don't have to do it this year because I know you went through a traumatic experience. Mm-hmm. I would look to increase the 403Bs respectively. And then I would look to see with extra cash and when you're de- depleting the inherited IRA, look to both do Roth IRAs. Okay. That's Those will be your three opportunities. And then as your income increases over the years, maybe you look to do like a non-retirement investment account down the line. Mm -hmm. Right, right. With extra money. Okay. With extra money. Yeah. Because as your your income will increase and then you'll have more, if you stay there, you'll still have more of a gap. So you'll be able to do the 403Bs, the Roth, and then your next step, stage three, would be a non-retirement account. Okay. An investment account. Yeah. That sounds great. Yeah. Do you have any other questions? I think the last thing is just, um, my mom is, she's looking at retirement way sooner than I thought she was going to. <laughs> so okay. she's 57, going to turn 50, 58 this year. Okay. And so she wants to retire when she's 62. I don't think she's personally ready <laughs> to retire at that age because yeah, her, her just retirement is, I've been able to look at her accounts and it's just like, I don't, I think she's just going to live on social security to be honest. Like it's not a lot. It's, I think under social security, yes. So living on, if your largest source of income, not your only source, but if your largest source of income is social security, it's generally not a comfortable retirement. Exactly. Yes. And I am trying to navigate these conversations with her, trying to delay her retirement. She does have a a a partner, um, her husband. So he brings an income and I think they're good now, but I'm just trying to, I think I'm going to have What happens? <laughs> yeah. So they're married. Yes. Yes. Okay. Married. So she would be entitled, if anything happened, she would be entitled to his social security. If they've, how long have they been married? Let's see. Two years. Two years. Okay. So she's yeah. just over the threshold. Yeah. <laughs> um, so um, do you know what his social security benefit would be? I have no, yeah. I'm just starting these conversations with her. Okay. I, I'm just anticipating going to have to support her in my, okay. in my future. I'm the oldest of four too. So I'm like, okay. everything kind of falls on me as the oldest daughter. And um, yeah, I'm just like, is there any way I can prepare to support her in the future? I think it's a important conversation to have with your mother mm-hmm. about two, twofold. Um, what does it look like if she retires and her husband is there, right? Income wise. Right. Also, statistically speaking, women outlive men. I don't know what the age difference is with her husband, but if they're at the same age, yeah, same age. Okay, even at the same age, statistically yeah. outlive women often die al- alone, like meaning they're they've either been widowed or um, divorced. Right. The statistics on women being alone is significantly higher than men. And so security is a gross number, not a net number. And people don't realize that. So no, there are, either. Yeah, yeah, nobody knows that. I teach a class on social security when I'm like, so this is your gross social security. People are like, no, 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 we don't pay tax. I'm like, yes, you do. Oh, wow. Okay. If That's depends good. on where you are. Now, your mother might fall underneath the threshold of being taxed, which means her retirement will be worse. If you're not paying tax, it's not good. Like that's not ideal. You want to be above the threshold for tax. Now, Social Security is only taxed at eighty five. Only eighty five percent of your benefit is tax. But to count to make the calculation for taxation, they count fifty percent of your benefits. Wild, yeah. Gotta love. I'm like, who sits down and comes up with these rules? This is crazy. So. I definitely think it's important for you because that's an important thing to know that if you think you're going to have to help support her, 
Yeah, so here are the thresholds. So married filing joint, if you make over 32,000, now remember 50% of your benefit counts towards that hurdle of 32,000. 50% of your benefits will be taxable. Married filing joint, if you make over 44,000, of which 50% of that number, 44,000 is your benefit, right? 85% will be taxed federally. Wow. Depends on your state, if it'll be state tax. Now remember, then there's also your Medicare premiums. So what's your, so Medicare starts at 65. Your mom wants to retire at 62. How do yes. we cover three years of Medicare or med medical? She's not eligible for Medicare. Right. That's, that's why I don't understand why she wants to retire even at 62 because of that, of that benefit there. <clears throat> Yeah. So, and you still have a part B premium. Like once she gets to 65, there will be a part B premium. She'll be in the lowest premium uh, yeah. threshold, but there is a premium. I do not think it's a good idea if your only, your largest source of income is social security. Some people that's all they have, but if your mom's 58, we have you have four, ideally she waits to 65 when yeah. she has medical, you know, that's some time to plan. Yeah. Yeah. Do you I know agree. what her, do you know I would just start with the gross versus net conversation with social security. Yeah, that's that. I did not know that. So I don't, I have a feeling she doesn't know that either. Most people do not. Yeah. Um, also, if she collects at 62, she's taking a permanently reduced benefit amount. Mm -hmm. Additionally, it's considered an early retirement. I'm going to guess her full retirement age is 67 based on her current age. Yeah. So that means that if she says, this is what I hear all the time. Well, I'm just going to get a part-time job. And I'll just supplement it with my part-time work. I'm like, oh, that's great. So then you're going to fall underneath the earnings test because you collected your benefit early. Mm -hmm. So if you make for every dollar you earn, you lose $1 for every $2 earned over $22,320. Wow. You lose half. Besides paying tax. Yeah. And besides a permanently reduced number. So you really have to be prepared to retire early and know there's three things you need to know. There's going to be taxes. If you take a part-time job, it has to be a nominal, like a smaller amount of money, right? That $22,000 number, you're going to lose half of your benefit and you're taking a permanently reduced social security. Yeah. So you're not getting 100% of your primary insurance amount, which is what you paid into, unless you wait till full retirement. Often, this is a conversation I have all the time with people, they say, I'm going to take the part-time job. Generally speaking, in a career, you're making the most money that you've made at your current job. Mm -hmm. And when you go to get a part-time job, people are often shocked to find out that they're not going to be paid very much because they're going to work part-time doing something that they don't have a skill set in, that they haven't worked their way in. So right. they're going to have to end up, to give you a perfect example, I had a woman Hated her job, very stressful, highly paid because she had been in this career for 30 years. I'm just going to go get a less stressful part-time job. She ended up having to work full-time mm. at this, yeah, well, because she couldn't make ends meet oh, okay. because her hourly was so much lower than what she made in her career profession because she had worked her way up, had credentials and skill set. So then she left that role into like an hourly like retail job. Yeah. And so ended up having to work so many hours just to make her mortgage when she could have almost made more if she'd just gone part-time in her career position because of the hourly difference, right? So people yeah. are often shocked at what, if you just walk into somewhere and you have no background, no experience, you're not going to have, you're not going to garner a high wage. Right. Yeah. So That's you, a huge adjustment. Yeah. it's a huge adjustment. And people yeah. often, I find that they're just so focused on retirement that they're like, I'm just going to get a part-time job. And they assume for some reason, they're going to make the same hourly. Like they're going to make 27 an hour or 40 an hour. And it's like, no, no, no. You're going to make half of what you made. You made 40. Now you're going to make 20. So to come up with the money you want, you're actually going to work almost a full-time shift, like right. hours. Yeah. And then they're like, oh, I'm like, so, or you could work five more years at your career mm -hmm. job, making the 40 an hour or 50 an hour, and then be completely done. Versus having to retire versus retiring early and then having to work like 30 hours at half of your hourly rate mm -hmm. to make up the difference. Yeah. So what I, the conversation I would have with your mother is looking at the numbers and the idea that if you can suck it up, I think, and work a few more years, you can have a permanent retirement with no obligation for part-time work, right? To kind of make the gap. And I think it's better to work three or four more years at your highest 
earning potential, then potentially seven, like, right, to just make yeah. the gap. You make a great point. So I feel like I have like the, the, the logic and the numbers now because – Personally, I just want to say, why do you think you can retire early? So it's yeah. like, now I have some numbers so that it's, I think I can, yeah, say those things. And like this that. is the other thing I say to people who want to retire early. If you really think you can do it, live on that budget now. Show me you're comfortable. So your gross social security is going to be 2000 after taxes and your Medicare. Let's pretend that we're going to have Medicare premium. Yeah. Let's say it's going to, you're going to net 1500 if you really think that's a comfortable number, live on it now and save the difference for the next four years. Right. Show me you can live on it. Right. Because what happens is they're like, well, I can't do it now because I'm working and I need... I'm like, no, no, no. If you want to live on it, yeah. live on it now. Yeah. And then save the difference. If you're bringing home 3000 now and you think you can live on 1500 you should be saving 1500 a month between now and that number and get comfortable with it. Because once you go to retire, it is very hard to go get that. Often you can't go back and get your job. Right. Yeah, that's very so, true. You, you know, what the analogy I use is if you're going to go off the high board in a diving pool, right? If you think about the tallest diving board, you don't get up there and not check to see if there's water in first. Right. Right? Yeah. So yeah. before you pull the retirement cord, you should be comfortable with what those numbers look like. And so if she's really adamant about retiring on whatever that number is, which you might think is too little, then she should be able to live on that now and show that and test it mm -hmm. before you decide to retire, test out that budget and make sure you are comfortable on 1500 a month. Yeah. Cause oftentimes, so the woman I'm referring to, um, I said, if you think you want to give up your career position and take an hourly job of which you have no credentials because your job is that awful, you'd rather do that. She made it, I think two years and went back to her career position. I see. Okay. She didn't like having to live on her story was very funny. She would go buy, I think it was a ham in the beginning of the week. And she ate the ham. It was like cafeteria style. Like she ate the ham because it was like the whole seven days. So she's like, by the end of seven days, I was eating like ham soup and oh, I no. just can't ever eat ham again. No. And I was like, you don't have to eat ham, but you do need to work like three or four more years in your career. And then you'll never eat ham again, ever. You or go. you could continue down this path of eating ham for seven years, working almost as many hours because you, we can't support the budget yet. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, I yeah. feel like I have some time, but I, yeah, I need to have these conversations with her now. Yeah. And I, I would approach it from more of, I, out of concern, I want to make sure that you're comfortable. And so I support an early retirement if you are comfortable on that number. So why don't we just try it? Yeah. Try it now. Yeah. And make sure it's comfortable because I can't think of a worse position than going into retirement and then being like miserable because you mm -hmm. can't afford to do anything. Yeah. Yeah. And she has a low cost of living, but they still do like camping trips and small things. And I'm like, you're not going to be able to think, I'm personally think you're not able to do those things if you're, this is the path you want to go on. So, and I, I can't supplement everything for her. No, and costs go up, her. right? Yeah. She's, if she retires at 62, yeah, right. Uh, realistically, like if she was sitting with me, we'd have to plan for at least at least 30 years. Right. Yeah. At least. Yeah. We have plenty of people who are living into their 90s. Like, what do I say? Like, sorry, money yeah. runs out at 92. You're on your own. Like, you, you still have your Social Security, but in 30 years, the cost of things like housing, medical... Yeah. You, you'll definitely need a new car. Right. In 30 years. Right. It, 30 years is a really long time. Yeah. To keep living. To be, to be living. Yeah. And, and that's what you hope, right? You hope you have yeah. a long retirement. You want to plan for a long, healthy retirement. Yeah. And I, I kind of see her mindset a little bit because she did, she did have a stroke in 2018, but she's mm -hmm. recovered greatly. So yeah, the hope is that her health is really good now. And so yeah, I will. I will talk with her and, and see how that how that goes with her. Yeah, yeah and then because the other thing is when you're in your career position, often the companies don't want to lose people, mm -hmm. so there is a little more room for negotiating. Maybe like like full time, part time hours, right? Or you can say, "I'm looking to retire," and so, but I'd like to stay on. You, you have more negotiating power usually with your career position at the end. You know. So that's another option. If you really run the numbers, she's probably better off, even if she went down, cut her hours by one day, she's probably right. better off there for longer than retiring early and trying to sup. Often I find women say, I'm just going to supplement it. And I'm like, 
walk me through that. <laughs> Tell me what, where have you looked at what hourly wages are, what the hours are going to be, what the work would be. Yeah. And there are some creative ways to do it, but oftentimes people are better off working a little bit longer to shore up the retirement, to make sure it is comfortable. Um, and it is probable for the time horizon. Yeah. Statistically speaking. Right. Okay. That's super helpful. Thank Cause yeah, it's, it's been on my mind this year. So, um, I'll start having those conversations with her. Yeah, absolutely. Because I think planning for retirement, in my opinion, should take three to four years, right? If we're planning for a 30-year event, we shouldn't be right. doing it in 12 months. That's just not yeah. practical. Yeah. So you want to be planning. It Usually what I say to people, if it takes you 30 years to get to retirement and we're planning for 30, we should have, I would say, at least two to three years at a minimum of planning okay. to be prepared. Yeah, that makes sense to me too. Yeah. But yeah, the taxes, people always forget about those taxes. Yeah. I had no idea. I know. The government <laughs> loves taxes. So, <laughs> um, well, very good. Well, thank you very much for coming on the show. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. This is super helpful. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. And for all of our lovely listeners, if you like the show, please share it with a friend and subscribe and like the show. And you can follow us on TikTok, YouTube, and Instagram. Time for our disclaimer. The opinions voiced in this podcast are for general information only and not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. All performance references are historical and do not guarantee future results. Make sure that you consult with your own legal, tax, and or financial advisor before making any decisions.